for Dr. David Heyman, who will be moderating today's panel discussion. In addition to being professor of infectious disease epidemiology at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and, and head of the Center on Global Health Security at the Chatham House in London, David Heyman is chair of the Strategic and Technical Advisory Group on Infectious Hazards, which advises WHO on the COVID-19 pandemic. His extensive technical and strategic knowledge of outbreak response is also based on decades of firsthand field experience and earlier high-ranking roles at WHO, such as the Assistant Director General for, Family, for Health Security and Environment, as well as the head of the global response to SARS. It's my honor and pleasure to introduce David. What we're going to do now is have a panel discussion with four uh, persons who you will know very well, I'm sure, actually five, I think. Tom Inglesby, who's joining us online uh, from Baltimore. Rebecca Katz, if you'd come up front, we could, or you can come up when you speak, whichever. Maybe now is best. Chris Morris from George Washington. Nancy from NIH, and Danielle from Kinshasa. Thanks very much for, um, for joining us today. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask each of you a question, and you can answer as long or as short as you, with a response as long or short as you wish. And what I hope you'll do is give a response. Recording in progress. And what I hope you'll do is give a response that will stimulate questions from the audience so that we can have a very good and interactive uh, session. And I'm also going to ask each of you as panel members to introduce yourself briefly after I call your name, because you'll do a much better job than I will at that. And be sure to tell us what your accomplishments have been. So let me start with Tom who's the director of the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security at the Bloomberg School of Public Health up in Baltimore. Tom. Yeah, thanks so much, David. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Yeah. I, uh, I am, uh, as David said, the director of the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security in the Bloomberg School of Public Health. I just finished a time serving in the administration at the Department of Health and Human Services and then at the White House on the COVID response and uh, my background is infectious disease medicine. And uh, let me just thank the Mario Foundation and Milk Institute for sponsoring this today. It's an honor to be participating in this event in tribute to the work of Professor Moyombe. Congratulations to you, Professor Moyombe, on being recognized for the extraordinary contributions of your career. And let me just say a few words about key capabilities we need in place to respond to new epidemics. There are obviously many things we need to do well to respond and get control of new epidemics. And let me just lift up a few that are particularly crucial at the start of a response to a new emerging infectious disease outbreak. Number one, highly effective lab operations and diagnostics. And we heard a lot, that, a lot about the work Professor Mayumbe has done uh, blazing that trail. Number two, a robust healthcare system. And number three, strong public health, a strong public health response. And let me make a comment on each. So effective lab operations and diagnostic efforts are really part of the backbone of a response to an epidemic. The response work to the new emerging infectious disease all depends on labs being able to get the diagnosis right and then being able to scale up diagnostic testing efforts in the community. We need to identify cases quickly, which means not only diagnosing those who initially present, but also going out and doing active surveillance in the community to quickly seek out new cases. And assuming a, a new epidemic is spreading broadly, we need diagnostic tests that are widely available, not only in reference labs. In the US at the start of COVID, it was a real challenge doing active surveillance of cases. And then it took too long for us to scale up testing commercially. So we were flying in the dark for too long. And so going forward, we need to be able to turn on high volume diagnostic testing much more quickly in the future. A second pass capacity to highlight here 
is engagement of a robust healthcare system. At the start of a new epidemic, we need to make sure healthcare providers are highly informed, which is exactly the process that is underway now around monkeypox, for example. Healthcare providers need PPE that will protect them from infection. And we saw that around the world during the COVID response, the initial phases in particular, we did not have that. We need to ensure access to sufficient oxygen supplies and mechanical ventilation and plans to provide surge. And all this requires planning and investment ahead of time. And my third capability I'd like to lift up, my last one here, is just is, is the overriding importance of a strong public health response. Public health is at the core of all of this work. Public health needs to both advise political leaders on tough choices and also to speak directly to the public about what's known, what's not known, and all the work being done to learn more. Public health needs to identify risks, analyze incoming data, assess the value of interventions, and they're often working in very tough environments. And in some parts of this country and other parts of the world, they have not been supported by political leadership. So we need to take time now to strengthen public health so that it can rise to epidemic challenges ahead of us. And so to conclude, I would just note that we've seen Professor Mayombe over the course of his career make countless contributions to understanding the infectious diseases that threaten us and to building these critical capacities that we all rely on. And he deserves our gratitude for this work. Tom, what role do the populations, especially healthy populations, have in a pandemic such as COVID? And how can we ensure that populations will be more fit to survive infections that might emerge in the future? Well, I think uh, two quick points on that. One, I think um, what COVID certainly did was to exploit the inequities that are in our own societies now. People who are already having difficulties with, with um, in accessing healthcare or an education around healthcare um, have suffered uh, disproportionately terribly in this pandemic. And the second thing I'd say, so, so working on equity, on equity issues now will help us get through crises ahead of time or in the future, I should say. And the second thing is, is that we need to engage the public in the response as active partners and not um, imagine that they're gonna be kind of herded into action Really, people take action when they believe it's in the best interest of themselves and their families. And so in doing everything we can to communicate well with people, to give them good information so they can help make good choices that help bring the epidemic under control. Tom's point about engaging the public, I think we also have an obligation to ensure that the public is more literate in health and what their roles and responsibilities could and should be. Um, and we think about our roles as public health professors and how we engage not only our students, but also how we work with populations. So I think these are some of the things that certainly, you know, we confront when we go out to respond to outbreaks is, well, okay, we have a, we have a, you know, a really bankrupt situation in, in many places uh, in terms of trust with the community. Uh, an ability to, to let them feel uh, agency in their own health. And I think that, you know, before we get to the point of an emerging pathogen, we have to really make those investments. And that's, that does sound, of course, very public healthy. Uh, but um, but that, that's really, I think, the best medicine for this. So. Tom, the, the intervention was politicians and the public need to better interact. I think that's what you're saying. And the politicians need to listen to the public health. Yeah, no, I, uh, I certainly agree. And I think there have been a number of really important studies that have shown uh, the importance of public trust in leadership uh, in terms of correlating well with su relative success, comparative success of countries around the world in the fight against COVID. And I think one of the key ingredients there is uh, in terms of people trusting their leadership is communication and engagement with the public and listening to the concerns of the public. Tom, the, the comment was the importance of communication and at the same time, how can we use mathematical modeling to help inform the population or is there some other way of communication? Yeah, <clears throat> in terms of communication, I think you know the, the general principles that I think most communication experts agree on is 
uh, is being transparent and forthcoming with information that's available and being on a kind of a reliable schedule, making sure we're delivering information to the public as soon as we get it. We'll be back tomorrow. Here's what we know, here's what we don't know. I think modelers are really important. I think there's an, a program in the US that was stood up in the middle of the pandemic called the Center for Forecasting and Analytics at the CDC, which I think is doing a really good job and will grow in, in value over time. We've seen the UK has an incredible modeling effort and ecosystem, which has helped inform the world. So the more that we can have good modeling, the better. It is difficult to model, I think in this pandemic we're in now beyond a month or two with reliability. So there's a lot of uncertainty in the future, but for the next month or two ahead, I think we need modelers to help us uh, make good decisions. Important comment, uh, Tom, it was how do you get the traditional system involved in outbreaks in developing countries? Yeah, it was a really important comment. And I think the, a common theme around the world is that people trust their local leaders, their respected local leaders, whether that's faith-based organizations or community, organiz community organizations. And the more that we can provide information to those local leaders, whether it's um, you know, in whatever country in the world we're talking about, the better that we're gonna be able to communicate with people and build their confidence in whatever interventions are important, vaccination, treatment, testing, masking. So I completely agree with the comment that was made. Thanks, and in fact, if you go with uh, Jean-Jacques Moyembe to an outbreak of Ebola, his first stop is not the hospital, it's the district commissioner. And he asked the district commissioner to call together, you saw the picture, all the traditional chiefs, and he tells them two things. He says, number one, this is a disease which is caused by evil spirits inside those people who are sick, and if you touch them or their dead body, those spirits will come into you and you will become sick. And the second thing he tells them is, there are teams coming in to help you please work with them. They go back to the communities, and that's why DRC has such an uh, excellent record of being able to stop outbreaks. And Daniel, maybe you'll talk more about that uh, later on as we go through. 